Welcome to the Midland Money Mindset. This is a podcast that's all about getting your mind right when it comes to all things money. In every episode, we go deep with engaging guests who provide tangible takeaways and a whole lot of joy along the way. I hope you enjoy these conversations as much as I enjoyed having them. Let's dive into today's show. So I have the pleasure today of being with Gary Arndt, the host of Everything, Everywhere, Daily. I am so excited for our conversation. Welcome to the show, Gary. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So listen, I want our audience to get a sense of who you are, what you're about. So can you tell us, you know, who is Gary Arndt? How did you get to where you are today? Oh, that's kind of a long story. Uh, <laughs> high school and college, I was probably best known as a one of the top academic debaters in the United States. I uh, was recruited to college to do that, placed in the top 10 in the United States my junior and senior years. Uh, started a very early internet company in the 1990s uh, that I sold before the dot-com bubble burst. And uh, after that, <clears throat> I went back to school for a few years, studied geology and geophysics, realized that I didn't want a career in academia. So I hatched the idea of selling my house to travel around the world for a year or two. Well, that ended up turning into 13 years, and my last international trip was literally at the start of the pandemic. I arrived home on February 28th, 2020, got COVID the first week of March, and then my entire I, uh, life kind of got turned upside down as I had been in the travel and tourism industry. I had a very popular travel blog. I was a very accomplished travel photographer. All my contracts disappeared. All the traffic to my website dried up. All the affiliate sales I had going on went to literal zero. And uh, I know some high ranking people in the, the world of travel and I talked to them. And I initially, like a lot of people thought that, you know, back in March of 2020, that this would be over in a few weeks. Right. And they said, no, this is going to be years to play out. And I realized I had to do uh, something. So I made a pivot, uh, not completely away from travel, but I still have one foot in it. But it allowed me to talk about a lot more than travel. And so I launched the podcast, Everything Everywhere Daily, uh, and Everything Everywhere was the name of my my blog that I've been using since 2006, well before the movie came out. Um, <laughs> and I created a daily educational podcast that covers history, science, mathematics, the new biographies of people. Every day is something completely different uh, and just things that I'm interested in. And I figured, well, if, if I'm interested in these things, and there have to be other curious people out there that would probably be interested in well as well. So on uh, July 1st, 2020, I started the show, and I've been doing it daily ever since. Done over uh, 1,100 episodes, and the podcast is now getting over a million downloads a month. Amazing. Amazing. Would, did you ever think that this is where you would be when you were you know, making that pivot back in uh, March, April, May of 2020? Yes. Um, <laughs> I had set goals. I mean, I'd been podcasting for a long time. Uh, right. The podcast we were doing was just more of a, you know, it wasn't very serious. We never made a dime off of it. Um, it was me and two other co-hosts. Um, but I'd been doing it a long time. I, I knew it very well. And I also knew people that had very successful podcasts, and I've talked with them. Uh, one of the things that constantly came up was the benefits of doing a daily format. Doing a daily show is not easy, but mm -hmm. there's enormous payoffs if you can pull it off. And given in the depths of the uh, pandemic, I had nothing going on. So <laughs> the work wasn't a problem. So I just threw myself into it. And uh, it, it, it's been very good ever since. Amazing. So let, let's uh, go backwards a little bit, because I read in early 2007, you sold your home in Minnesota with the goal of traveling the world for about a year. And, and you talked about this earlier, and then you decided to really travel indefinitely. You know, what inspired your decision to stay on the road and, and not have it come to an end after a year? The world's really big. Uh, <laughs> it took me six months just across the Pacific Ocean, uh, just island hopping between all the little island countries. You know, a lot of people going on a round the world tour, all they'll do is hit some of the high points. They'll go to right. like major cities, uh, you know, in different countries and that's their tour. But I was going everywhere. I was going to very obscure places, very remote places. And, uh, that just kind of 
never ended. And, and the blog that I started also became popular as well. I think in large part because I was visiting so many obscure places at a time when few people were doing that. Travel blogs weren't a big deal back then. The term digital nomad hadn't then existed yet. <laughs> uh, and uh, in 2010, Time Magazine named me one of the top 25 blogs in the world. Uh, that helped. So it allowed me to uh, keep traveling. Eventually, the tourism industry, which is a notoriously backwards industry, uh, warmed up to the internet. I mean, which literally, you know, as all this stuff was happening online, they were years behind still right. thinking that print magazines were the future as they were dying off. And in, in many circles, that's still the case today. Right. Um, but yeah, I was able to, to keep traveling. Um, I eventually did get an apartment towards the very end before the pandemic, but I was still on the road like half of the year to a third of the year. So still wow. most of the, the, a lot of time uh, traveling. That's amazing. I mean, we, we talk with the families we serve all the time about traveling and, and being able to take that on. And the fact that you're able to do that is just amazing. I mean, many people really dream of embarking on long term travel, but really, I think they find it a challenge to make that leap. Right. If if I'm someone or for someone who may be, you know, thinking about taking some type of long term travel and maybe even just the year like you talked about embarking on originally, you know, what advice do you have for somebody like that that's looking to embark on that kind of uh, experience? Well, I think everybody should travel for at least a three month stretch at some point in their life uh, and, and ex travel extensively. The best time to do it is between some major event in your life. It could be between college and getting a job. It could be between jobs. It could be at a point when you're moving. It could be after you retire. But there's some point in your life where you're going to have an opportunity to do it. And the reason why those are good points to do it is because you could sell your home and then put your stuff in storage. And while you're you know, in between selling one home and buying another, you basically don't have a lot of the expenses that you would otherwise have. Travel can actually be really cheap. What makes it expensive for most people is the fact that when they go on vacation, it's not like they get a refund. It's like, you know, you don't call the mortgage company and say, hey, I'm not going to be home for two weeks. So we're just not going to pay two weeks worth of the mortgage. It doesn't work that way. Right. But if you could actually, you know, put a, tr a trip in between these points in your life where you're not paying for mortgage, rent, utilities, insurance, you know, gas, all the other things that that add up in life. uh then it can be really cheap. And it, a lot of it depends on where in the world you travel as well. If you insist on only staying in five-star hotels in Europe, you're probably going to be spending a lot of money. Whereas if you're willing to stay in smaller guest houses in somewhere like Central America or Southeast Asia, uh, you'll be shocked at how, just how little it costs to travel. So what I'm hearing is basically you can make it work if you want to, to fit that budget. You know, it, yes. it could almost, it could almost be a wash between, and I guess, again, it depends on where you live today and then where you're going and how you're going to travel. But in many cases, there are ways that if you do it right, you can almost design a way that your loss of expenses that you're going to have by selling the house and downsizing all those material things that you're not going to have to upkeep would equal whatever that experience would look like on the other end. So cost wise, it's really not as big a hurdle as many people may think. You know, after I sold my business, I bought a 3000 square foot house, beautiful place on a lake by myself. One guy can't live in 3000 <laughs> square feet. Most of it was empty. It was furnished like a bachelor. And uh, after I sold it, I realized I, I just don't need to live in something this big in, again. Um, but yeah, the, you can make it work. A lot of people just have it as a wish, like, oh, someday we'll do that. Right. And there are no concrete plans. But the moment you put a concrete plan into place, it's like, okay, 2025, we're doing this. We're going to, you know, and a lot of times, you know, even the most obscure places in the world are actually not hard to get to. You just have to buy a ticket to get there. Right. Um, and if you just, you know, take some concrete step and say, okay, this is the time we're going to do it. It took me about a year and a half to sell my house and to kind of unravel all the stuff I had going in my life before I was able to start traveling. So I'm certainly not saying you could just drop everything and right. do it, but it is something you can do if you set it as a priority. 
with proper time and planning, it right. sounds like it's something that you can easily execute to over time, right? Not right away. So, you know, you talked about, you know, launching the Everything Everywhere Daily podcast really was out of a framework of a pivot. When you, when you initially embarked upon that, did you have any thoughts of monetizing it or was it really just a venture that you that would allow you to continue talking about things that you enjoy talking about? Oh, it was a business from day one. Uh, the very first episode, I had an ad in it, even though nobody was buying ads. Uh, what I did is I just created my own ads uh, for products that I had on travel photography, as well as for affiliate programs that I just signed up for. But the point is from day one to get people accustomed to the fact that this was a podcast that had ads. It took me about 18 months to develop an audience big enough where I got the attention of networks. And then, you know, another 12 months after that, where I was able to get the attention of major networks where I could really start monetizing it. And uh, that's kind of where I am right now. So things are going pretty well on the monetization front. And the beautiful part is uh, podcast scale. So mm -hmm. I could increase the size of my audience tenfold without really increasing my workload tenfold. And as it is right now, uh, I'm doing everything. I don't even have assistants or a staff. So uh, there's very little overhead. You're looking at my studio. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the cost of equipment for a podcast is very low. Uh, so and one of the advantages I, I say that I had is that I had no choice. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the, the best things you can do to be successful in a business is, is a sense of desperation that you have to make it work. And no the reason plan B. Yes. And the reason why so many podcasts fail is because it's just a, a side thing that someone decides to do. And when something comes up and something always does come up, the podcast gets put aside and then it's forgotten and then it's abandoned. I right. made this the core of everything that I was doing. And now it's, it's grown enough where I can now think about doing other things around it uh, as w with money making ventures as well. Yeah. So, you know, you lead me right to the next thing I'm really curious about, right? Because as somebody who, myself, who struggles to write, right? How do you find inspiration each day? Because again, this isn't a weekly even, it's not a bi-week, not a month, it's a daily show. So how do you find the inspiration each day to come up with new, fresh, interesting content? I, uh, when I started the show, the first thing I did is I kept, I wrote a list of a hundred show ideas. Many of those original hundred I've yet to even do episodes on. And over time, it just keeps growing. And, uh, one show will beget five new ideas for other shows. So for example, uh, minutes before we started this conversation, I was finishing up writing today's show, which is about Alma Mahler. Gropius Warfel, who was this woman who married three of the top artists of the early 20th century, had affairs with many others, and had this very fascinating and interesting life. And that was an idea I originally got from a Tom Lehrer song that he recorded back in 1965. Um, and I, I just had it on the list and I thought, okay, this would be a good thing to do. And there's almost uh, 950 show ideas that I have. And uh, so like today's show, I was writing it and I was writing about Walter Gropius. I was like, he founded the Bauhaus School, which was one of the uh, things that really influenced a lot of modern design in the 20th century of things like furniture and architecture. Uh, if you've ever seen a Bauhaus inspired object, you'd know it immediately. You've probably seen a lot of it. Uh, but I thought, okay, this is worth a, an episode of its own in the future. Because uh, I've actually been to the Bauhaus school in Weimar in the course of my travels. So that was one example how one thing leads to another, even though they, they may not even be right. that closely related. Has the uh, the dailiness of the podcast, has that put a crimp on your ability to travel and do other things at this point? Or is that something you're prepared to do on the road? Um, yeah, I haven't been out of the United States since the pandemic started and I certainly could travel now, but I've kind of caught lightning in a bottle with the podcast. So I want to keep riding it until, uh, you know, I can, uh, could I do this on the road? Yeah, I certainly could. And I probably will at some point. It's just that right now, uh, the podcast has been my focus. It's doing really well and I want to keep it growing. So, yeah. and, and like I tell people, I've traveled a lot. <laughs> you know, so yes. I, I, I am, there's a, I would say a very, very high probability that I'm the best traveled person you may have ever met. And so it's not like, you know, it, it's something I, I need to get out of my system. I've done a lot of it. So right. I will travel again. Uh, but right now, this is what I want to be doing. Um, so I'm going to keep doing it. 
So, yeah, listen, I mean, you definitely are the, the most traveled person I've ever spoken to. You know, you traveled to over 100 countries, all seven continents. You know, what are some lesser known destinations that you believe you found on your travels that more people should know about or think about, you know, visiting as well? Sure. There's there's one place I always mention on when I do interviews, and I mention it because I know no one's going to actually listen and go there. It's one of the greatest national parks in the world, and it's accessible for most Americans. It's Nahani National Park in the Northwest Territories of Canada. It's quite a bit of a drive, uh, but when you get close, there are actually no roads connecting the park, which is why it only gets 800 visitors a year. Oh, there wow. are more people entering Yellowstone or Yosemite in an hour in peak season than enter this park in a year. And it's one of the greatest national parks in the world. Uh, when it was put on the UNESCO World Heritage List, it was done so alongside the Galapagos Islands and Yellowstone, just to give you an idea. Wow. And almost no one knows about it. <laughs> so how far, how far do you have to, how close I should say, can you get via car before you have to embark on getting there? Uh, there are two places you can uh, get in a plane, a float plane that will take you there. One is Fort Simpson, Northwest Territories, and the other is Lake Muncho in northern British Columbia, uh, kind of from, from either end that will fly in. Um, but yeah, but because you have to take that extra step, most people don't do it. And that is really the problem with a lot of tourism. Uh, there's been a problem lately called over-tourism. And over-tourism is, is really a problem of too many people visiting the same place at the same time. So, <clears throat> for example... One of my favorite islands in the Caribbean is the island of Dominica. Dominica is the least visited country in the Western Hemisphere. The reason is because it's a very mountainous island, and they can't put in a very large runway for large jets to land. So if you have a uh, large jet flying in from Europe or Miami or someplace, they, they can't land there. So they have to land in a nearby island like uh, Martinique, Guadeloupe, or uh, St. Lucia. And from there, it's a short ferry ride or a short flight over. We're talking like a 15, 20 minute flight, very short. But because it requires that extra step, most people don't bother going there. And Dominica is a incredibly beautiful island, arguably the most beautiful in the Caribbean. It has 365 rivers, one for every day of the year, um, hot springs. It's great. And no one goes Sounds there. Sounds great. Sounds um, great. There, there are places in the Pacific as well that I always recommend. Um, <clears throat> Samoa is one of my favorite countries in the world, and most Americans would never think to go there. Uh, a place like Fiji, they've probably heard of. Uh, what a lot of Americans don't realize is they're down, because most of their visitors come from Australia and New Zealand. Their winter is our summer and vice versa, which means the North American winter is their low season, which means you can actually see lower crowds and probably better deals uh, than you could. The only trick is, again, it's a long flight from LA to Nandi in Fiji. Uh, but you arrive in the morning, it's flying west instead of east, which I found usually is better for jet lag. Um, and again, a lot of people go there. And I could go through this with places all over uh, the world that people just don't know about. And I think a lot of it is due to a lack of imagination. Most Americans couldn't tell you the name of a city in France outside of Paris. Right. But there's a lot of great things. So <laughs> right. if you're going to France, you're probably, most Americans will probably end up going to Paris. So what I'm hearing is if you want to see really interesting places and perhaps not go to that over tourist uh, attraction type environment is look for those opportunities where it may be slight, there might be a slighter, higher hurdle to get to that location because most people aren't really willing to take that extra step. And you could probably find a very unique and enjoyable place to visit, it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, even if you're traveling to Europe, uh, Dubrovnik has become a city with tons of tourists, but no more than, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 miles away is the city of Kotor in Montenegro, also right on the sea. Looks a lot like Dubrovnik. It's a fraction of the number of tourists. And Montenegro is way cheaper than Croatia is right now, especially Dubrovnik. Um, all over, you can find these fantastic places to visit. And I, again, I think a lot of it is uh, travel is a skill. Mm -hmm. In so far as I you agree. develop confidence, the more you travel and a lot of people, if they're not well-traveled are not very confident in visiting places due to language or they have fears because the only thing we hear about most countries in the news is if something bad happens, right? If something, you know, if there isn't something bad happening, we don't hear anything about it at all. 
And so our perception of many places is that it's dangerous and unsafe, when in reality, there's a good chance that people living in the US may be living in a city that's far more dangerous than most of those countries are. <clears throat> Agree. Agree. So, I mean, listen, you, this extensive travel experience that you've had, you know, it's certainly how, how has that shaped your perspective on the world? Cause I, I have to imagine it's had to have an impact in that regard, you know, spending as much time as you have outside of the, the borders of this country per, you know, that, that alone, that alone. Oh, it absolutely has. Uh, when I hear about things in the news, they tend to resonate with me a bit more because <clears throat> there's a good chance I've been to that place. So if a natural disaster strikes some country, it's usually just uh, something happened to some people somewhere that the name of the country and the place doesn't really matter because you're not familiar with it. But when you've been there, you know, oh, that, that was that street, that was that building. And it, it brings things home in a much more visceral way as if it kind of happened to your hometown, a place where you know, you know, you know the buildings, you know the shops. Um, so yeah, like there, there have been things happening in Sri Lanka and I was in Sri Lanka, one of my last trips before the, the pandemic. And um, literally there was a terrorist attack in the restaurant where I went to breakfast at the hotel every morning while I was there. And I'm pretty sure some of the people I met every morning, the hostesses and the staff were killed in that attack. And you know, that, that does something to you and is more meaningful in a way than if you just hear something, you know, random on a news in a place that you're, you're unfamiliar with. Right. And I'm, I'm imagining, you know, a lot of these places that you hear about, you, you are familiar with, cause you've had an experience at some point, probably traveling there in, in many respects. <clears throat> yeah. We're talking to people that express some, you know, very vehement opinion about a place they've never been. Right. Uh, you know, when people talk about the Middle East, you know, it, you know, depending on what they say, I'll, I'll ask them, well, when was the last time you were there? Nine times out of 10, they've never been there. Right. And they really, what they know about a place is through kind of these vague general stereotypes of it that they kind of paint with a very broad brush um, that, that they get from the media. And they don't really understand uh, what the place is like. And that occurs all the time. Um, a good example is uh, a couple years ago, there was an Ebola outbreak in the nation of Sierra Leone. Um, there were people canceling trips to South Africa because of what was happening in Sierra Leone. Africa is really big. Yeah. Sierra Leone is closer to London than it is to Cape Town. And people were canceling trips to Cape Town because it's in Africa which made absolutely no sense, but because right. they have no semblance of Africa and where Sierra Leone is and the other things, they were making uh, decisions that made absolutely no sense. <clears throat> yeah, I think that happens a lot, right? In life, broad generalizations based upon a specific statement and causes uh, you know, situations like that. I think it happens very often, not only in travel, but uh, in life in general, we see it all the time. I just so. did an interview with a podcaster who was in Argentina. She was living in Buenos Aires and she would often get things from, you know, her friends and family saying, Oh, is it safe there? Are you all right? And I said, here's what you do. Next time something happens in the United States, that's bad. Give it a week. All right. Call up your friends and family and ask them if they're okay, because you heard something happened in America. And we don't think of it that way. If something right. happens in New York and you live in California, well, that, that's way over there, right? But from the perspective of someone who lives outside of it, you could say, well, it's all just the United States, right, right. which is what we do to other countries. So if we hear of something that happens in Mexico, we paint all of Mexico with the same brush, where in reality, Mexico is a really big country. And what happens in the north near the border is very different than what happens in the Yucatan. Agreed. Agreed. So, I mean, you, you know, I want to kind of bring this down on a business level for a minute because you have a significant social media following, right? And I think to the degree that a lot of businesses, a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they strive for that type of following. How do you leverage your platforms to inspire and connect with fellow travelers around the world? Because it's a great tool to do that. 
So, you know, share with us, because I think it's applicable to a lot of different businesses and a lot of different, uh, you know, opportunities to utilize a similar strategy in a similar way for them. Okay, here's the, the honest truth. So I have six figure followings on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I even almost had 2 million followers on Google+. Plus. It's mostly garbage. I had a very early verified account on Twitter, which resulted in tons of spam accounts and bots that followed me. Same is true on Facebook. Um, I don't even use social media that much anymore. Podcasting is such a superior vehicle for developing a following and getting a message across on social media. It, it, it's not even, they're not even in the same ballpark. Um, people become enamored with social media because there's a number next to your name. And the association is if I can get that number bigger, then somehow I can make more money, get a following or, or whatever. And it doesn't really work that way. Ultimately, whether or not someone sees your message is determined not by the number of followers you have, but by an algorithm. Right. And Facebook has over time continued to decrease the organic reach of everything you do to the point that if you have 100,000 people following, you are not going to reach anything close to 100,000 people. You might not even reach 100 people because to prom they, what they want you to do is promote it and spend money, which at that point, you're just buying ads and there was no point in developing a following to begin with. Right. The same is now true with all the changes that have been uh, implemented on Instagram, or I'm sorry, on, on, on Twitter. And uh, Instagram has kind of become the same thing. The beauty that I found in podcasting, and by the way, I don't even promote my podcast that much on social media anymore because I found there's almost no relationship between posting stuff and, and getting people to listen. But having someone li listen to your voice for an extended period of time establishes authority, expertise, experience in a way that you cannot do as a disembodied text message or an image on social media. Even on TikTok or, you know, or, or uh, Instagram Reels or something like that, where you can have a short video, it's so ephemeral and brief. Can you tell me the last 10 things that you liked on social media? Not at all. No. I asked this question to everybody and no one can remember it. Yeah. And the question is, if it's all ephemeral and it doesn't stick with you, then what was the point? Right. Whereas with podcasting, for example, I get emails and reviews all the time from people, you know, people that, that, that listen with their family and their children. And, uh, this one woman just said, you know, my daughter was having a discussion about the element, pl uh, polonium, uh, the isotope polonium 210 at our dinner table the other day It's like, that never would have happened if it wasn't for your podcast. So when you listen and you can, and, and, you know, get a deeper understanding and relationship with someone, it's far more profound. And, even if the numbers are smaller than, than the number that appears on some social media website. So to be completely honest, I would not pursue a social media strategy right now. I mean, by all means have an account, but it, it, I don't think it's all it's cracked up to be. And it's not what it was 10 years ago because these companies have, have uh, constricted your ability to get your message out so much that I don't think I would, uh, you know, make that the center of any sort of marketing policy. Yeah. I, I listen, I agree with you with podcasting specifically, you know, again, whether the numbers are big like yours at a million downloads a month or even smaller, I think the fact is whatever the size of it is, you know, you have a niche audience that you are connecting with and that's really what it comes down to. That's the importance. And it doesn't, you don't, you know, you can have 500 downloads a month, but if they're the right 500 people that you want to connect with, then that's a, that's a great, you know, that's a great project. That's something that's really adding value and, and, uh, your thought leadership, right? Absolutely. And there are some very successful podcasters that don't have huge audiences because they have a very targeted niche with a product or service that they're trying to sell. And right. they're able to do it, uh, in a way, probably you know, better than any other marketing vehicle I can think of uh, because they have a dedicated audience. You know, uh, for a show like yours, you know, with, with an investment and finance background, I can kind of take a guess as to the type of audience you have. And I'm guessing it's a very high quality audience, right? As opposed to right. some show that was talking about the Kardashians, 
they may have a much bigger following, but I don't think it's going to be as high a quality an audience, right? In terms of right. people who are actually interested in ideas uh, and are willing to listen to discussions as opposed to just someone who's concerned with celebrity gossip. Agreed. Agreed. So I want to shift gears for a minute. And uh, I, I have to say, you know, one of the things that I, you know, came to learn about you, and that was through Instagram was your photographs. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, really great. And they're so powerful. And what I would, what I'm interested in knowing is what advice do you have for the average traveler who on their travels wants to try to capture the beauty of the world as they go through their, you know, expeditions and their travel. Do you have any guidance for them that want to capture some of those moments? Uh, I, I think they'll be hard pressed to do them in the same way you do it, because I think they're fantastic. But are there things that they should be thinking about along their travels to do something uh, to capture those moments? Uh, yeah. Uh, one of the first things is to understand how your camera works. Photography is not rocket science. It really isn't. <clears throat> but if you own a camera that's anything above a smartphone, there's going to be various buttons and dials on it. And those buttons and dials do things. The vast majority of people put their camera in automatic and never do anything else. You can, what those buttons and dials do are just a few things, primarily dealing with exposure. And that's how much light's coming in the camera. And that involves the size of the aperture, the, how fast the shutter goes, and then also what's known as the ISO, which is the sensitivity of the sensor. And those are really the three things and you can adjust them back and forth. And the other thing is to simply take a purposeful photo. So I see most people and they just hold their camera out in front of them and they just stick it in front of something and hit a button as opposed to taking the time to think of, well, what, what angle, how should I do this? What should I get as a backdrop? How should I look at the light? And just taking a little bit of time to think about that uh, can usually result in a much better photo. And the other thing I, I notice people do all the time is they tend to take the object of whatever they're looking at and put it dead center in the camera, in the frame. And that is probably something you don't usually want to do. Uh, you maybe want to offset it or a little bit, uh, depending on depending on what the image is. Uh, there are times where centering it is appropriate, but uh, you just don't necessarily want to center everything all the time. Right. So if I use these tips, will my photographs be as good as yours or what? <laughs> uh, well, the other step in that is editing photos. So uh, back in okay. the days of film, uh, you would take your photo but then you also had the dark room and right. most people just sent their, 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 you know, film canister into a Walmart or something, and then they get the films back. But in the dark room, photographers would have to make creative choices. Do I want this lighter? Do I want this darker? How sharp do I want this? And those were things that most, most people, uh, you know, amateur photographers never had to deal with. Well, the dark room today is simply on a computer. And you can use programs like Lightroom instead of Darkroom or Photoshop, mm -hmm. or there, there's many of them where you can make those creative choices because the camera is not capturing reality. The camera is capturing an image and the light through the settings. And if you set it on automatic, it just means the camera is going to determine it, not necessarily making the right ones. So you also have to uh, make some of those decisions in post-processing as well. And most people never bother doing that. And there's a few things you could just even hit the auto button uh, to to auto edit. And that's probably going to improve most images. Amazing. Well, I, I encourage everybody to take a look at your photography. It's uh, it's amazing. It's it's really breathtaking. And uh, congratulations on that. So listen, Gary, it's been a great conversation. And we ask each of our guests the same final question, because this is the Midland Money Mindset. And we're all about joy here. And that is, what did you do today that brought you joy and put you in the right mindset for success? Uh, well, I just woke up. So, uh, you know, the first thing I do every morning is I write. And uh, that's, the, you know, I, it allows me to write and research about whatever that day's episode is going to be. And I always get to learn something new every day. And that is the one thing that my entire podcast is about. And the thing that I encourage is that education and learning is a lifelong thing. It isn't something that is boxed into a certain period of your life when you're young. In fact, most of our learning will come after that. And if you think of most of the things in your life that you know, it probably didn't even occur in a classroom. 
It occurred through life experiences or things you absorbed or things you read. And everyone uh, should have some sort of strategy or some sort, something in their life that allows them to continually learn. And my podcast is, you know, it's 10 minutes every day. You can learn something brand new. There are other ways to do it as well. But um, if you don't do that, you, you might even be a very successful person, but you'll also probably be a very dull and uninteresting person. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I'll tell you this, the everything everywhere daily has got to be added to your queue, because I think that's a great way to set up that process of learning something every day, you can guarantee yourself in basically 10 minutes or so you'll definitely learn something for the day. So I think that's a, a great tip. Now we're going to have all of your information in the show notes. But if people want to connect with you, learn more about you, I, I think I know what you're going to say, but what's the easiest and the best place for them to do that? Wherever you're listening to this podcast right now, just search for Everything Everywhere Daily and start listening there. Awesome. Well, listen, it's been a pleasure, Gary. Thank you for coming on the show and uh, enjoy the day. Thank you.